Welcome to Blind Spots, a podcast where we're helping you fill the gap between what you want to do with your money and what you actually do. We are professional investors, writers, and financial planners helping you navigate the complexities of finance to optimize what you can control and cut out the rest. Join your host, Nick Shermans and Aaron Varghese, as we discuss the questions and nuances surrounding everyday money management. Investment advisory services offered through Pure Portfolios, a registered investment advisor with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Nick Shermans and Aaron Varghese work for Pure Portfolios. Any opinions expressed by Nick and Aaron or any podcast guest are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of Pure Portfolios. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for investment decisions. It should not be construed as legal or tax advice and is not intended to replace the advice of a qualified attorney or tax professional. Clients of Pure Portfolios may maintain positions and securities discussed in this podcast. This information is not an offer or solicitation to buy or sell securities. The information contained may have been compiled from third-party sources and is believed to be reliable. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Blind Spots. In today's episode, we are going to be talking all about hot takes, or rather get, getting Nick's hot takes on some of these topics related to investing and finance. So the inspiration for this episode came from a couple that my husband and I were hanging out with one night, and one of the guys just had hot takes on a lot of different life topics. So it was a fun conversation, very lighthearted, but it's interesting when people just have these kind of polarizing opinions. So I've worked at Pure Portfolios for just over two years. I've heard Nick talk a lot, and I think that he's got a unique perspective on some different things. So the purpose of today's episode is to get Nick a little worked up, raise his cortisol, and huh. get his opinion on hot takes. What's, what's your definition of a hot take? I think it's anything that the general public would probably just stop and huh, that's interesting polarizing opinions maybe yeah what's and your I think, definition of a hot take i don't know like to me a hot take you might say it as an insult and i and i don't think you mean it as an insult but no, no to me hot take like i enjoy hearing people's unique perspectives because that means you're an independent thinker mm -hmm. and i feel like in 2022 with social media Humans are tribal beings, and I feel like we've, not to get political, but but we've used politics to fill that vacuum. Like, we, mm -hmm. we rely on politics for so much, and we're looking for identities and a sense of belonging and, and, and being in a tribe. And I think that lends itself to just swallowing a fire hose of belief and not being able to think for yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think that's bad. So when someone says, I'm rogue or I'm a lunatic or I have hot takes— that just to me means I can independently think, and I think we all would be better off if we independently thought and took time to do that. That's true, and I don't think that people really do take very much time to think because we're always just consuming information from other people, and people are just so easily swayed. Like, they believe whatever they read. There used to be a funny, like, oh, do you believe everything you see on TV or the internet or right. whatever? And people totally do. Yes. And, and, Again, human, this is a human experiment. All this technology and social media, humans mm -hmm. aren't meant to digest the mountains of information. Like, like I read something, a human back in the 1700s consumed X amount of information over a period of like 30 years, like a mm -hmm. lifetime. We, we consume that in a period of like three hours now. Yeah. And it, it leads to unintended consequences. And I think some unintended consequences with the polarization and the divisiveness in this country are part of that. And I don't know how it ends, but early reports are not good. Well, I heard something interesting, and it sounds true, so I believed it, but I don't know the real statistics behind it. But something along the lines of the smartest people hundreds of years ago had a fraction of the information that we have access to within right. minutes today, which is true. But it's just amazing how almost dumb we've become. Like, we can't do anything for ourselves anymore when we have access to all of this information. Well, and, and then this is the last thing I'll say, and it's, it, it really is sad where, you know, I'm, I'm hearing stories of people deciding who their friends are in social groups based on how they feel about politics. Mm -hmm. and, and, and when you think about that, surrounding yourself with people that view the world the same way that you do, it's almost a, and, and I read this, uh, I forget the book, but it talks about the problems with social media. And it's, it's, it's a weird way of, of worshiping yourself. 
surrounding yourself with those that think like you is a weird way of worshiping yourself. You want more of yourself. And I think we would all do better to not only empathize and, and understand the other person's point of view, but but inverting problems and, and, and thinking about things the opposite way, seeking out opinions that challenge your point of view rather than confirm it. And, and I've, I've talked about that as a skill, as a uh, good investor, but it's also a good life skill. Mm -hmm. Very true. So let's get into some of these hot takes. So the first one that we are going to talk about is planning versus investing. Because we've, well, I'll let you get into it, but it's easy to put your investments on autopilot. People that have come out and they're only offering financial planning services because it, it's, it's easy to automate. It's easy to put money away every month. You know, you use a robo advisor that it's seen as easy. And they are talking about how the investment piece is not as important as planning. So as a professional investor yourself, what is your opinion on this? So, so let me give you some context and know that I haven't, I, I hadn't seen any of these questions that Aaron has until maybe five minutes ago. So this feels a bit like entrapment, but there's a, there's a ongoing debate in the, in the advisor community between CFA types, investment types and financial planners, CFP types. And both sides are railing against the other saying investing is more important or planning is more important. And over the last 10 years where the market has gone straight up, it, it kind of felt like the planners were winning, right? Because investing was really easy the last 12 years. Markets went straight up like 13% a year. So that lent itself to the planning community saying investing is a commodity, meaning you can get it anywhere. It's all the same, yada, yada. I didn't engage in this debate, but I thought it was not complete. And we're seeing that it's been exposed a little bit. It's easy to parrot planning is the most important thing when the market's going up by 13%. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't really heard those people be as loud over the last couple of years when portfolios right. are down 30, 40%. Investing very much matters as planning very much matters. It's not mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. You can have a person like Aaron on your team, who's, a, who's our lead planner, very good at financial planning. You can also have a person like me on the team who's a CFA. I'm a professional investor. I write a lot. I do a lot of research. I, I run the entire investment platform at Pure Portfolios. It's not mutually exclusive. You can have both. And I think it's a dangerous conclusion to plant your flag on one side or the other. Mm -hmm. That's good. I don't think that that is, it's a pretty mild hot take, depending on who you're talking to. So that's, we're starting off easy. Yeah. You know, I feel that like that was a layup. Okay. So kind of in the same vein, give me your thoughts on active management versus passive management. Active management, active mutual funds versus like a Vanguard fund, right? That's kind of been mm -hmm. the big debate. And I think yeah. that's a misguided debate. It's not active versus passive. I think most people should reframe it as high cost investing, active is high cost, passive is low cost investing. As an evidence-based investor, I'm a fan of optimizing what I can control. And hiring a active mutual fund that charges over 1% or around 1% with the promise of outperforming empirically has not worked. And that's just, and that's not my opinion. You can go on the S&P Spiva website. So the S, so global S&P or S&P global, excuse me, publishes a report every half year or every year. I think it's twice a year showing the performance versus active mutual funds across every asset class, every equity asset class. So you can see how an active U.S. large cap, an active U.S. small cap, an active foreign stock uh, fund has done relative to a predetermined benchmark. And the numbers are dismal, okay? So when you're paying up for the promise of outperformance, that lowers the chance of outperforming on a net of fee basis. It probably has nothing to do with the skill of the manager. These are all very smart people. It has everything to do with starting out roughly 1% behind the benchmark each year, which is like running a race with your shoes tied together. So you can be in the active camp, you can be in the passive camp. I think that's a wasted argument. Pay attention to what you're paying. High cost investing is inferior to low cost investing. I will die on that. So many people have questions about why we don't use mutual funds. And you mentioned a lot in what you've just talked about. They, they've been used for forever. So mm -hmm. why is it that they are still so widely used and people are still touting that it's the best option? But are they? Okay. So that's a loaded question. 
the reason so to tackle one and you're gonna have to remind me of the second part of the question why pure portfolios refuses will never use mutual funds one i just talked about it the cost two they're tax inefficient okay you can own a mutual fund in a non-retirement account and get saddled with a huge capital gain at the end of the year for doing nothing mm -hmm. because that manager that is actively managing that fund is buying and selling over the course of the year they're passing all of those gains onto the shareholder. So very tax inefficient. The third thing, which I, I absolutely can't stand, if I was to buy a mutual fund at 8 a.m. at the market open, if I was to buy it, submitting a buy order, I would not know the price that I received until the end of the day, end of market close. Mm -hmm. Who in the hell buys something, a high dollar amount item, and you don't know the price that you get for it. You could buy a mutual fund in the morning when the market is when the market is down, let's say, right? Let's say you're trying to target your buy when the market is down. It's down 1%. At the end of the day, the market is up 10%, let's say. That fund is up 10%. You're not going to get the down 1% price. You're going to get the up 10% price. Mm -hmm. Completely different game. That, it just doesn't make any sense. So watch what these mutual fund companies are doing right now. They're converting their most popular mutual funds into ETFs because everybody on earth knows, including them, the gig is up, the game is up. Everything is shifting to ETF umbrellas because it's a much more friendly format to own any asset class. Well, that essentially answered the second part of the question too, that I said that maybe I said everybody should have said there are still a lot of people who, who use them and, and are not changing. The, the people that use active mutual funds are advisors that work for big Wall Street firms because there's a huge conflict of interest, mm -hmm. all right? One, many of these big banks, and they're supposed to be fiduciary banks, are paid by the mutual fund companies to allow their funds on the private bank or big bank's platform. So their advisors have access to this menu of funds. The fund companies are paying to get on that. The advisors use those funds to invest their client money. That's, that's a conflict of interest on the non-fiduciary side, on the broker side, on the, you know, there's a firm out there that's notorious for this. The advisors get paid to use certain funds. Mm -hmm. the, the advisors get kickbacks from the fund companies to use certain funds, a blatant conflict of interest. If I'm compensated to use fund A, but I know fund B is probably better, but I'm not compensated to use that fund, I'm going to use fund A. And that happens over and over again. And there's a firm out there that manages $1.7 trillion. They openly share this information. It's absolutely ridiculous. And mm -hmm. for the clients that work with them, I mean, you have to be asleep at the wheel because you are just getting absolutely crushed. I mean, some of these portfolios that, that come across our desk, and this is why I push back on the investing as a commodity thing, the offenses are so egregious. High cost mutual funds, advisors charging clients 1.5%, tax inefficiency, taxable investment income, Short, like huge ticket charges to trade. This mm -hmm. is all happening in 2022 and it's absolutely ridiculous. And it's a mix of ignorance. It's a mix of the clients being asleep at the wheel. It's a mix of misaligned incentives and conflicts of interest from the advisors. And it's just, uh, it, it really makes me sick, but it also is the reason why I get out of bed because there's a huge opportunity for lower cost firms like Pure Portfolios that are fiduciaries that actually care that are fully transparent about fees, it's just a much more friendly arrangement for clients. Mm -hmm. Okay, while we're on the soapbox, requirements to become a financial advisor. No. If you wanna become a doctor, you're in school until you're almost 40. If you want to become an attorney, you have to take one of the hardest tests in the world. How about becoming a financial advisor? So the requirements to become a barber or a hairstylist are more intensive than to become an advisor. And hey, nothing against barbers and hairstylists. I, I There's nothing worse than a poor hair. But the barriers to entry to become a financial advisor are absurdly laughably low. Mm -hmm. Where someone could study, someone who comes off, like, like you've seen that CFP commercial where the guy's like a DJ by day, puts yeah. on a suit and wears makeup. It was a ridiculous commercial. But that's not far from the truth. Someone could come in off the street, study for a week, take an exam, all of a sudden, they're qualified to give someone who's grinded for 35 years, saving and investing, watching their penny, uh, or, excuse me, watching what they spend, living within their means, with, with one day a dream to be retired, and they're getting advice 
from this newbie off the street. It's, it's an absolute joke. And many of these Wall Street firms will hire anyone with a pulse as long as you can sell. And they'll ask you something like, write down your 50 closest friends or family, and let's try to set up a meeting and close business. It's like, that is egregious. And also, no, there's no continuing, no continuing education requirement for advisors. So once you're in, you are in. There's no formal investment training. Mm-hmm. So w- one of the completely backwards preconceived notions for consumers is that advisors spend their day doing investment research, placing trades, managing portfolios, mm-hmm. writing commentary, that they're savvy, experienced investors. I would say the majority of advisors have no clue what they're doing on the investment front, Front have absolutely no, no clue. Mm-hmm. They, they get top of the house guidance from the firm that they work for, but oftentimes, if you were to look at the average portfolio across a big Wall Street firm, let's say with a thousand advisors, you would have a thousand different portfolios because these firms allow their advisors to express their own personal portfolio management uh, spirit or themes or style. And there's mm-hmm. as, as long as it's within the goalpost and it's compliant, they allow them to use their own canvas and paintbrush. And you get a mess of stuff in the stuff, again, that we see. I, I, I do this every day. And I see some of the biggest, most reputable firms that manage trillions of dollars violating basic principles of portfolio management. And it's, again, it's egregious, mm-hmm. but, it's, but it's why we get out of bed every day. Yeah, the requirement for continued, or the, the non-requirement for continued education always kind of gets me. Because every other professional certification or any other professional essentially has continuing education to keep up with the times. Like this is an ever changing industry. And if there is an industry that you should have continuing education requirements, it's this one. I mean, new stuff comes out all the time. And if, if you ignore it, you'll just never know. Yes. And I will die on this hill. Clients that are doing business with big wall street firms and non-fiduciary brokers you are asking, you're asking for it. You're asking for trouble. Financial services, and I'm not making any of this stuff up, the most fined and least trusted industry in corporate America. And it's not even close. So you, there's all these Netflix films about bad actors and pharma and, and big oil and yada, yada. They pale in comparison to the egregious offenses year in and year out of big wall street firms and brokerages. So if you're, if you're working with, if you're willingly giving your money to these people, you are doing it wrong. Like that, it just doesn't make any sense to me. And I've worked inside these firms. I've seen it. 90% of what they do and talk about is how to monetize their clients, how to get more assets in the door. That's all, that's all they talk about. That's all they care about. That's all they're compensated on. It's like get out of that labyrinth of sales and cross selling. It's, it's doesn't lend itself to good client outcomes. The one thing that I will say, because the compliance ears are listening, is that there are good and bad actors everywhere. That correlation does not necessarily equal causation. So just because you work at a big Wall Street firm does not mean that your advisor is the worst. But yeah, no, that's that's a good qualifier. There's there's good people that work at these firms, but I think the incentive system is what's off. Yeah. So these are well intentioned people that want to do right, mm-hmm. but if if your compensation is dependent upon you acting a certain way because the incentive system is in place a certain way that directly oftentimes works against clients. Like one thing I always tell people, look, if it's, if it's between doing right by clients or maximizing the bottom line, maximizing your comp plan, hitting a sales target, which results in a bonus, um, who do you think is going to win? Like these wall street firms all have to report earnings. Mm-hmm. Every quarter, they're under a microscope. They're trying to squeeze every ounce of margin out of you, the client. Who do you mm-hmm. think is going to win? Doing right by you or maximizing the bottom line? The latter is going to win out every single time. On that note, annuities, insurance, and other commissioned products. I mean, anything that takes 300 pages, like like when you buy an annuity and you get mm-hmm. a 300-page booklet, like, I mean, that's just ridiculous. It's complex because it's designed to throw you off the scent of what they're right. really doing. So if you want to lock your money up, if you want to pay exorbitant fees, if you want your advisor, quote unquote, to get a commission of like 8% of the amount that you're investing in in, in an in a annuity, then, then go right ahead. Um, you know, I always say, well, there's an old saying, annuities 
are not bought, they're sold. No one wakes up in the morning and uh -huh. says, hey, you know, I think I want to buy an annuity. Uh -huh. They oftentimes get accosted by someone in their church or in their social circle, and they get sold. Yeah. And I've spent more time trying to decipher annuities and trying to get people to unwind them, and it's a freaking nightmare. Mm -hmm. So make sure you know what you're getting into. They're designed to confuse. They're designed to throw you off the scent of what is actually happening. And again, anything that takes 300 pages to explain, I'll take a hard pass. You can't explain it to your grandma in 30 seconds, then don't buy it. That's a good rule of thumb. How about fee transparency? You talked about fees associated with mutual funds earlier. What about fee transparency with your advisor? If you don't know what you're paying, which most people don't, which is confounding to me, but if you don't know what you're paying, ask your advisor. If they're not forthright with the information, run away. If your fees are not on your statement, that's a problem. We, we put our fees on our website. I think that should be the standard, but it's not. Um, and also you should push for the all in cost of investing. Like what your advisor tells you, oh, oh, you pay 1%. Okay. That's, that's not your overall cost of investing. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really three parts. One part is what you pay your advisor. So let's say you're working with the wall street firm. They charge you 1.25%. They use mutual funds. There's a expense every year for each one of those funds. Let's say on average, that's 0.6%. So six tenths of 1%. Let's say it's in a non-retirement account. Well, those mutual funds are going to spit out capital gains. So it's what you pay your advisor plus the mutual fund expenses plus your tax drag. And many of the prospective clients that we see that work with these non-fiduciary advisors, these big Wall Street banks are paying over 2% a year. Okay. When, when the market's up by 10% a year, you know, you can kind of get away with that. When the market's down by 20%, uh, and you're taking funds out of your portfolio and you're giving up 2% a year to your advisor and their firm. I mean, you're just asking for trouble again. That, that's just not a good equation for you. Mm -hmm. Two more. The next is. A little bit more on the behavioral finance side, so fitting for blind spots. Mm -hmm. Is personal finance more about the numbers or behavior? 100% behavior, because I can do a quick, I can go on Google, do a quick search and find out what to do. Most people don't do it. Mm -hmm. uh, so a big part of personal finance is being self-aware, being in touch with your habits, being in touch with your biases and blind spots, understanding where your leaks are. That's, that's 99% of it and having the willingness and the initiative to recognize the problem and change because the formula for getting your finances order to getting your finances in order is not hard. It's not rocket science. Mm -hmm. Most people, a lot of people play the victim or don't, don't recognize the problem. You know, they focus on small things and they get the big things wrong. You know, there's all mm -hmm. these personal finance gurus that say you shouldn't buy a latte because it adds up and you won't be able to retire. Like that's, that's preposterous. If you get joy out of the small things, do it, get the yeah. big things, right. Mm -hmm. That's, that's what I tell people. But a lot of it just comes down to being self-aware and being honest with yourself and having these difficult conversations with your spouse or yourself that tends to move the needle more than creating spreadsheets and tracking every dime that goes out the door. Yeah. The latte thing has always been kind of funny to me because it shouldn't matter what it is that you spend your money on. Like you said, it's just the basic principles. Like if I want to spend $500 a month on Starbucks. That's great. As long as I'm saving and investing, then who cares what I do with everything else? Right. Get the big things right. Okay. Last but not least prevalent this year, flipping in and out of investment plans. So abandoning a well thought out investment plan. We've seen a lot of people who, and we've talked about this before, but seeking risk when times are good. So like you said, the last 10 years, you can basically throw spaghetti at the wall and it sticks and shunning risk when markets are bad. So this year, a lot of people feel very uncomfortable with the portfolios that they've built that are over allocated to equities. Yeah. And look, th this is an uncomfortable year. Uh, there's been no place to hide. Every investment strategy is down unless you stockpiled money into energy stocks, which no one wanted to own the last 15 years. So let's assume our listeners are experiencing some level of pain, which is, I think, a reasonable assumption. What, what we've been telling people is everyone's going to experience pain in this environment. Our focus is mitigating damage. And I think 99% of, 
emotional or suboptimal investment decisions stem from rejecting losses. People embrace risk during good times. It's easy to be an aggressive investor when markets are going up by 13% a year. It's much more difficult to be an aggressive investor when tech's down by over 30%. You know, a lot of people were over allocated to tech. That's been the um, one of the worst areas of pain. And I think for a true 100% equity investor, a true risk-seeking investor, this type of market environment doesn't really bother them. Like, like me, me, me personally, I'm a 100% equity investor, mm -hmm. okay? I understand negative 40% is a potential outcome. Yeah, I can't get the 10% a year without the occasional nasty drawdown, without the occasional loss. I understand that. I'm a student of market history. Many people will joke, they'll say, oh, you know, I want to make money, but I don't want to lose money, ha ha, and they'll kind of nudge you, but they, but they really mean <laughs> They're not that. joking. That's, that's not realistic. Yeah. Because if, if that's how financial markets worked, where you could set your watch to 7 8% a year, banks wouldn't exist, money markets wouldn't exist, bonds wouldn't exist, our financial system would not exist. Mm -hmm. So think about negative outcomes, however uncomfortable that they might be, as the cost of admission. You can't get the 10% a year without the occasional loss just the cost of being an equity investor. And look, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying 100% equities is appropriate for everybody. Build a portfolio that mirrors the way that you feel about risk, really understand the range of potential outcomes. You know, I think there's been some pretty good examples the last couple of years that a 60-40 portfolio, if you look at 2020, can go down over 20%, okay? Mm -hmm. So get in touch with reality, get in touch with outlier events, these black swans, these nasty outcomes, That'll help you help frame expectations and build a portfolio that you can stick to during good times and bad times. Yeah, and bringing that just back around to the first topic that we touched on is that your investment plan should make sense in the context of your entire financial plan. So you talk about not seeking additional risk. When you don't need to. When you don't need to. <laughs> yeah, like I always tell people, don't, don't take risks where the best outcome won't change your life. Yeah. Like if you take your... 1.5 million and you turn it into 2.8 in one year, probably not going to change your life, right? I mean, that's great. You'll probably feel good, but it's not going to change your life. Mm -hmm. You take your 1.5 and turn it into 600,000, that's probably going to derail your plan and hurt pretty bad. Mm -hmm. So don't take risks where the best case outcome won't change your life, but the worst case outcome is going to put you on the street. Beautifully said. I think that's a great place to wrap it up. Thanks for giving us your hot takes today. It was exciting. Well, and if I could speak to compliance, I didn't name anybody. This is how I feel. This is how I talk. I, I hope I didn't offend anybody. I am passionate about what we do at Pure. I really have a, I don't know if vendetta is the, the right or wrong word, but I, I just take personal offense when I see good people, good clients getting taken advantage of and they don't even know it. Mm -hmm. And I get great satisfaction in finding a better home for uh, clients that are working with advisors that are openly giving conflicted advice and, and charging exorbitant fees. Mm -hmm. If if those clients come to Pure, that's great. If we can find them a better home, a lower cost solution, even Van, we've, we've sent clients to Vanguard, to Schwab directly, mm -hmm. not working with us at all. Yeah. And I take great satisfaction in that because I believe I'm doing them a great service in the long run. They're gonna save thousands and thousands in fees and they're gonna avoid a catastrophic mistake. Mm -hmm. Well, your passion shines through. Thanks for listening to this episode of Blind Spots. We will see you in the next one.